Well, good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you here to the State Line Seventh day Adventist Church here in the middle of the Walla Walla Valley. I want to thank you so much for joining us for our weekend that we've entitled Preparing for the Harvest. And so let me ask you a question. How many of you is at your heart's desire that with the help of God and the help of Christ and the help of the Holy Spirit that you're going to prepare for the soon coming harvest? You and I are going to be a part of that harvest if we will let God work in our lives. And so this morning for our Sabbath school time, Pastor Larry Kirkpatrick from the Deer Park District here in the Upper Columbia Conference is with us. And our study is entitled Original Sin and Questions on Doctrine. And so we're going to have a good study here for Sab School. And also would like to remind you, if you have any questions that you would like to turn in this afternoon at 4 o'clock, there will be a Q&A panel and we will consider your questions that you've turned in and a few other questions that have been turned in uh, over this, this past previous year. And so I think two questions came in last night uh, in the question answer box in the foyer. One question was called in this morning. So we'll do the best we can to answer your questions this afternoon. If you have any more uh, after Sabbath school, be sure and go out in the foyer. We'll have a short break between Sabbath school and church. Write down your questions, and we'll do the best we can to answer them. Again, uh, thank you for joining us. would like to thank our viewing audience and those of you online uh, for joining us. We wish that God's richest blessing would be upon you as you join our study together. And let's do begin with prayer. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for the privilege that we have to, in our Sabbath school, study your word as we consider this important topic of original sin and questions on doctrine we ask that you would be here among us speak through pastor larry and we pray that everything that is said and done would be to your glory your honor and exaltation in the name of jesus we pray amen good morning church so we have a, a lot of information in a short space today, so let me just go ahead and preview to what we're going to do. We're going to spend a, a significant period on history, uh, the history around QOD. Then, we're going to, then with the second section is kind of about original sin, and then the last one will be a Bible study on the doctrine of sin, and we'll be starting in Genesis chapter 4 when we get there. But before we begin, I want to just go ahead and tell you uh, something about the conclusion, uh, and then we'll go on through. Uh, so let me start, though, with sources. Uh, if you want to study about questions on doctrine, uh, one of your best sources is the book, Questions on Doctrine. <laughs> uh, this is one of the original uh, 1957 edition. Uh, this is almost the gold standard also. This is Zwiehak Nam. Uh, he did a dissertation, Reactions to the Seventh-day Adventist Evangelical Conferences and Questions on Doctrine, 1955 through 1971. Uh, the, the historical material on questions and doctrine in here is really exceptional, and uh, you'll hear me refer to these a lot of times. I probably won't give you the page numbers, but these are some of the resources. Um, this one's probably not so much on QOD, but on original sin. Uh, Edwin Zacherson, he used to be a Seventh-day Adventist, and he used to be a Seventh-day Adventist theology teacher. Uh, he believes in basically original sin, but he's not a Seventh-day Adventist anymore, but he wrote about original sin in this book. Um, this is the reprint edition of Questions on Doctrine that came out with another 60 or 70 pages of notes. Uh, George Knight edited, and um, the first, that new section of 60 or 70 pages plus the annotations through it makes this a, uh, a good resource. Um, there's another one I don't have with me, Herbert Douglas, Fork in the Road. Uh, and that began really as this little booklet, which we have some of these tonight, Opportunity of the Century. Uh, Herbert Douglas wrote this for us, and he expanded it into Fork in the Road. So in one short place, I think that might be Remnant Publications, you can get Fork in the Road, but we also have these little booklets. So just some resources, and I'll be referring to these, and I probably won't give you the page numbers for time, but um, this is, uh, what's interesting about all this is what? That uh, some people, questions on doctrine is a big, it's a big uh, mystery What's that all about? It sounds very confusing. What's interesting about it is that really, 
what we're going to do this morning is basically in a short space tell the story of QOD. A story has a beginning and it has a middle and it has an end and QOD isn't really a story that we don't know the ending of yet. We know the ending of it and so I'm going to tell you the whole story basically. Um, lessons we can draw and we haven't done it yet but this is now, um, this is how uh, the elect, even the elect can be deceived when we trust in the arm of flesh because without meaning to I believe that this is what happened in this uh, episode of QOD. Uh, another lesson, this is a really a case study in self-deception. It's a case study in Laodiceanism and we don't have to wait to the future for examples of Laodiceanism. There's a multitude of examples in the past and so this is one of the examples. Uh, and then also um, we can know the story and we can benefit from its warnings. So we'll carry on right now and jump in on our story. I'd like you to join me now on a road, tri on a road trip to the 1950s, QOD, and the question of original sin and what the Bible teaches. Uh, so listen to this uh, quotation here. This comes from our current statement of fundamental beliefs. This is the 1980 voted this, this statement, and this is an excerpt from the statement number seven, the nature of man. This is what we believe. When our first parents disobeyed God, they denied their dependence upon Him and fell from their high position under God. The image of God in them was marred and they became subject to death. Their descendants share this fallen nature and its consequences. They are born with weaknesses and tendencies to evil. Now we're going to come back to that wording uh, at the conclusion of our study this morning, but they are born with weaknesses and tendencies to evil. That's very important to understand what Adventists do and don't teach on sin and, and human nature. So let's venture backwards in time and now how much, how long is it? It's about 61 years or so to 1957 and we'll even go back to 1955 here. In 1955, the first of 18 meetings were held between Seventh-day Adventists and a group of evangelicals that met with our people. The outgrowth of these meetings was this book, Seventh-day Adventists Answer Questions on Doctrine, known unaffectionately ever since as QOD. Uh, and it's acknowledged by basically everybody as the most divisive publication in Adventist history. It's sitting right here next to me. Walter Martin was a rising evangelical researcher in cults and he was planning a new book on Adventists. Uh, in the process of his research, he approached Seventh-day Adventists. He approached our leaders with certain questions. So on the Adventist side, uh, the people up there were Leroy Froome. Uh, he saw this inquiry as an opportunity to try to get the Seventh-day Adventist church extracted from that, that terrible category none of us want to be in of cult. And so face-to-face um, -face, face -face meetings were arranged and the first, were, the first meeting was held from March 8 to 10 and that was the year 1955. At the General Conference headquarters is where this happened. Now the Adventists involved in the series of meetings were T.E. Unruh, he was a conference president, Walter E. Reed, he was a soft-spoken General Conference field secretary, uh, Leroy Froome, who I would describe as a researcher, historian, seminary professor, and an aggressive personality. And uh, then also the head of the Ministerial Association of the General Conference was an evangelist, Roy Allen Anderson, who was involved in some of these meetings as well. So those were the Adventists. On the evangelical side, uh, Walter Martin's associates included Donald Gray Barnhouse. He was a Presbyterian pastor and he was the editor of Ministry of Eternity, rather, Eternity magazine and George E. Cannon, he was a New Testament theology professor uh, focused on biblical languages. So at this first meeting, it was uh, Professor Cannon and Walter Martin, they came together with Froome and our Adventist group. So this first meeting began with Martin asking a series of pointed and even slanted questions. Uh, what troubled Martin and Cannon the most, wrote uh, Nam in the book I shared with you a minute ago, uh, was uh, questions about the deity, the, in, these, these Adventist teachings on the nature of Christ. Many of Martin's most pointed questions were about what kind of humanity Jesus had taken. So now in this, as after uh, Martin launched his first series of, his series of questions, the Adventists responded with very carefully prepared written statements that they'd worked out and the evangelicals were really kind of surprised. It didn't turn out quite the way they expected. And so they, they uh, were both kind of, everybody was kind of happy and they agreed they would share their questions uh, and answers kind of in written format through these meetings, these three days. So what happened then was um, Martin and Cannon were given a stack of books to support the claims that the Adventists had made in their first set of answers. Uh, 
and uh, given a stack of books there and sent in the other room. Froome and his Adventist, uh, the Adventists that were with him, went and kind of debriefed in their room. And uh, Froome spent the rest of the afternoon writing out another two dozen about pages of answers for these evangelical uh, visitors who were checking and seeing what do we or what don't we believe. So that, that night, Froome's secretary stayed after hours typing this all up nice. And that very evening, uh, uh, Martin and Cannon were given the, the pages that had been typed out that day. And that was the end of the first day of the meetings. That was March 8. So let me quote and give you an extended quotation from Nam's book here on what happened on March 9. When the two parties returned to the General Conference building the following day, March 9, what Martin made a dramatic announcement that shocked the Adventist conferees and permanently changed the nature of the relationship between Adventists and Evangelicals. He and Cannon had po poured over the documents given to them and reflected on the discussions of the previous day until 2 a.m. As a result, they had concluded that they had been wrong in their past assessment of Seventh-day Adventism. Here's what Martin said. While we did not expect things would turn out this way, we are now prepared to say, how generous of him, sorry, that's an interjection. We are now prepared to say, you folk are not heretics as we thought, but rather redeemed brethren in Christ. Amen. With this newfound conviction, Martin stood in stark contrast to what he, not only his own earlier writings, but also to the entire evangelical world. He made it clear that he now believed that Adventists who believed as did the conferees were truly born again Christians and his brethren in Christ. And then in a dramatic gesture, he extended his hand in fellowship. Walter Martin wanted to shake our hands. Change was in the air. Now in the weeks and months that followed, there were a deluge of letters from Froome to GC President Figure. And Froome was writing and kind of pushing on the president with all these different things. So Froome insisted that Adventists must place, quote, the gospel as shared with the evangelical world prominently in the presentation of the Adventist message, unquote. Uh, T.E. Unruh, I mentioned a minute ago, here's how he tells it, quote, the evangelicals helped Adventist leaders to express their beliefs in terms more easily understood by theologians of other communions, unquote. Now in his letters, Froome suggested, and again I'm quoting, that many Adventist leaders supported the idea of a sinful nature of Christ without understanding all its implications due to imprecise theological thinking and lack of experience in communicating with other Christians. So Froome would come, you see, to share certain ideas about uh, what the gospel is. He'd come to share a lot of those ideas with the evangelicals. He, he had the similar beliefs. And so Froome agreed. Jesus could not have a post-fall humanity. The atonement, it must be completed at the cross, on the cross. And fallen human nature itself is basically guilty in this viewpoint. And so Froome labored to persuade Adventist ministers to teach these things. And there was a full-scale uh, uh, onslaught of teaching and pushing uh, in various Adventist uh, publications and at the seminary and so forth. But now there was a big problem. Because you see, theologically, these Adventists were in over their heads. Froome was a remarkable historian, and there's, nobody would question that. But in terms of systematic theology, these Adventist leaders were, were really outclassed. They were outclassed. Although Martin and his evangelical associates' understanding of sin was wrong, they had a stronger grasp of the theological ideas, how things fit together. And they could see how the adoption of certain ideas would create the need to adjust other Adventist teachings which they thought were wrong to begin with, and so they were glad to see our people sort of fine-tuning. There may be more than fine-tuning, retooling. Now, to invite these evangelicals to help us explain our theology was what? Oh, it, was, it, was, it was wrong, but it was also dangerous. It was just plain dangerous. The Adventist churches would pay a very high price for their overconfidence. Froome, Reed, and Anderson were the new guard, but they were too eager to please, and they were not theologically astute enough, and they didn't really pass this test. Meanwhile, the church's strongest systematic theologian, and you might have heard this name before, a man named M. L. Andreasen. He had been recently retired. The Froome group was very intentional about keeping him out of the loop, and they also wanted to keep F. D. Nicole out of the loop. They said, F. D. Nicole, he's too sharp, so we can't have him involved in these meetings. <laughs> 
So uh, people were kept out of the loop. The new guard is kind of uh, uh, paving, uh, paving the way straight ahead. Now, by the way, some people have represented Andreessen as, as kind of a crank. He was a, kind of a grumpy Adventist pastor. Well, do you know what the facts really are? Andreessen had spent his life advancing the work of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Yes, he'd served as a pastor, but uh, not only as a pastor, he'd been the president of college, he'd been the president of conference, uh, he'd become the most widely appreciated Adventist author of his era. The last decade of his professional life saw him serving as field secretary for the General Conference. Andreessen was the most brilliant Adventist writer on the Sabbath and on the Atonement. The Review and Herald had published his book on Hebrews in 1948. It was still kind of new at that time. This is the 1950s, but in 1948, our, at first, that he first came out with uh, the book on Hebrews that Andreessen had written there. As a younger minister, he had even spoken with Ellen White. You see, Andreessen was kind of a link between eras in the Adventist work. But um, in the 1950s, we had a troubling new period of time that began, and our strongest theological thinker was set aside. Well, the meetings with the evangelicals gave birth to the book QOD. QOD, it's not entirely bad. It's not entirely negative. The writing flows. It assembles a wealth of historical sources. Its approach is positive, and portions of it do contribute to Seventh-day Adventist scholarship. And yet, it remains the most, uh, ag the most aggressive attempt to revise Adventist uh, teaching uh, that there ever has been. Even the, even the work of Desmond Ford, I don't believe, matches uh, what was attempted or desired in Questions on Doctrine. Dramatic changes were attempted in QOD. There's three areas that stand out. Those three areas are the atonement, the nature of Christ, and the doctrine of sin. So on the atonement, Questions and Doctrine presented what we would probably have to say is a slanted view of the atonement. In this little booklet I had uh, from Herbert Douglas, he wrote this. The general emphasis in there, in QOD's answer, unnecessarily threw the center of gravity onto the cross, thus minimizing the equally essential role of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary even though that may not have been their intent. He said that Andreessen was wary about Calvinism's limited gospel, which focused, uh, focused Christ's atonement ministry primarily on the cross. He feared that the Adventist twin focus on Christ's atonement ministry on the cross and in the heavenly sanctuary was being muted. Were Andreessen's concerns valid? You kind of wonder, well, were, were these concerns valid, or was he just making noise, or just static? Well, Donald Gray Barnhouse, I mentioned him a few moments ago, he participated in the meetings in 1956 that were held. He responded to a letter to an R.A. Grieve who had just been released from the ministry in Australia. I guess that means he was fired, or at least he quit. But this is what Barnhouse wrote to Grieve, quote, The whole doctrine of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment have undergone recasting and reinterpretation in Adventist theology within the last few years, and in the new definite volume by which he met QOD. These reinterpretations are rather plainly evident, he said, referring to QOD. In his 1965 book, The Kingdom of the Cults, Walter Martin wrote this, The Adventism of 1965 is different in not a few places from the Adventism of 1845, and with that change, the necessity of reevaluation comes naturally. And later on, I also in the same book, uh, page 365, uh, Walter Martin wrote, In recent years, however, there has been a definite movement toward a more explicit declaration of belief in the principles of the Christian faith and the tenets of Christian theology. In short, clarification and redefinition have characterized recent Seventh-day Adventist theological activities. Walter Martin. Martin puts clarification and redefinition in quote marks there. And the reason why he wrote that, uh, he, wrote, he wrote in another place that the original Adventist understanding on the atonement quote, has been repudiated by the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. He said, current Adventist writings teach that the atonement was completed on the cross. That's what Walter Martin wrote after this in 1965. What's interesting is if you read the uh, QOD, uh, it, they have a totally different story. We weren't writing new doctrines or changing our teachings. We were just restating them uh, for people to understand well. So there's two stories about QOD. Nothing new, just the same old. Uh, and the other story from the evangelicals was, hey, the Adventists have been changing some stuff, and they're coming in, they're coming in the line. Two different stories. So most Adventists missed the changes. The evangelicals saw what was happening, and they were all thumbs up. Well, let's move on here. 
In QOD, the nature, position that Jesus took in the nature of Adam after the fall was changed to his having taken the nature of Adam before the fall. So I mentioned three main changes in QOD, the, on the atonement, the nature of Christ, and the doctrine of sin. Now we're on the nat nature of Christ. Uh, again, we'll just quote here from Herbert Douglas. Uh, the, there was a, in, in this book, in the back, there's an appendix uh, that includes a, a compilation of Ellen White statements, and that's kind of become a very important piece of this whole discussion. Herbert Douglas remembers about this, quote, As an associate editor of the Review and Herald, I had the luxury of research in the publishing house's magnificent library. I began to read the context of each of Q, QOD's statements that seemed to be cherry-picked by someone who tried to emphasize a certain point of view. One by one, I would bring those statements to Kenneth H. Wood, editor-in-chief, and we stared with amazement at someone's remarkable disregard for context. This collection of tampered quotations has become, ever since, the armament factory for teachers and pastors and authors who relied on this collection for their understanding of Christ's human nature, thus missing the big picture. And that was Herbert Douglas on the nature of Christ in QOD. But there's a third topic we mentioned where QOD attempted to change Adventist understandings, and that is at the doctrine of sin. Anglican Jeffrey Paxton, author of the book Shaking, The Shaking of Adventism, wrote that the idea of original sin had been, quote, almost entirely absent, unquote, in the, in the earlier years of Adventism previous to this. That's page 99 of his book, The Shaking of Adventism. In Adventist history, that was earlier, but he said that the new interest in the subject spawned by what? By QOD was what he called a, quote, soteriological gain of the 1960s, soteriology being uh, the doctrine of salvation. So he said the questions on doctrine, this was an interesting line in his book, Jeffrey Paxson's book, page 94, questions on doctrine turned toward the Catholicism, small c, of the reformers. Kind of interesting. We'll maybe talk about that if we get a chance in the panel to today. But uh, there we have some changes on original sin. Edwin Zacherson, I showed you his book, the red and white book here. Uh, he wrote this. In the 1960s, the present writer researched the published writings of M. L. Andreas in, in an effort to trace the effect of his rejection of original sin on his position regarding the moral nature of Christ. The study suggested that there was a direct correlation between his own conclusions and that his objection of, to the 1957 Adventist statement on the nature of Christ in QOD stemmed from a reticence to appreciate sin beyond its actual, actual nature. So that's what Zacherson said, who now I believe is no longer a Seventh-day Adventist. Zacherson's understanding of sin is mistaken, but he correctly saw the difference between these two approaches, uh, the evangelical approach and the previous to that Adventist approach. Uh, on the back copy of this red and white book I showed you, Zacherson's book, he wrote this, he talked about this, uh, about original sin. He said, while not allegedly part of Adventist uniqueness, this idea of original sin touches virtually every area of their theological thought. Very interesting. Looking at QOD itself, is there confirmation that there was issues about original sin in QOD? Well, the QOD author's desire to introduce original sin, uh, we see some evidence of it scattered through. Besides, we'll get to the handout I gave you just a moment ago. Uh, in QOD on page 383, speaking of Jesus, the authors of QOD write this, quote, although born in the flesh, he was nevertheless God and was exempt from the inherited passions and pollutions that corrupt the natural descendants of Adam. He was without sin, not only in his outward conduct, but in his very nature. That's a quote out of QOD. See, the authors assume right here that in our, quote, very nature, that we have sin. And carefully, they, what do they do? They exempt Jesus. But think of the very thing that they've done. Don't let this zoom past us here. They exempt Jesus from our very nature. In other words, they're saying that, that Christ, that Christ had a different nature than Christians, than the nature of the Christians who are followers of Christ, that he's an example for and a substitute for. Original sin is also implied in QOD on pages 22 and 23 with this categorical statement, quote, in common with conservative Christians and historic, the historic Protestant creeds, we believe, and there's a list of uh, beliefs, and he goes and down that list, they say this, they believe that, that man was created sinless, but by his subsequent fall entered, now listen, they, we entered a state of alienation and depravity, unquote. 
Now notice here, human alienation and depravity is here defined as a, as a state of being, which is really just another form of this false doctrine of original sin. Contrast that idea with Ellen White's nuanced discussion. This is from uh, In Heavenly Places, page 195, a quotation. In our present fallen state, all that is needed is to give up the mind and character to its natural tendencies. In the natural world, give up a field to itself and you will see it covered with briars and thorns. But if it yields precious grain or beautiful flowers, care and unremitting labor must be applied. So, so Ellen White says that this, he points out that the descent to a situation of depravity and alienation, that's accomplished how? By nature or by choice? Ellen White tells us there that it's accomplished by choice. We choose uh, which way we'll go. By giving up, she said, the mind and character to its natural tendencies. So we're not born guilty or we're not born alienated, but we're born damaged and very ready on a whisper's decision to accomplish alienation. Ellen White calls her situation a fallen state. She doesn't call it a state of alienation here. The example she gives is that of the field cleared, uh, cleared, and then left to be overgrown. The cultivation of grain or flowers is going to take some energy. It's going to take some effort. But do you remember what the Bible tells us? Jesus lights every man. John, Gospel of John chapter 1. He lights every man. Jesus he sort of clears the field here. And yet left to themselves, what will fallen humans do? By our choices, we will accomplish alienation. We certainly will. But it remains important to understand that God doesn't cause us to be born in a state of alienation. He doesn't cause us to be born guilty. We're born damaged. And he doesn't like that, and we don't like that. And the gospel is to restore us out of that extraordinary damage. So uh, more on original sin. Let's zero in a little bit more on original sin. While studying in the Loma Linda Heritage Center, I came across a portion of a pre-publication draft uh, of uh, QOD, a section of the book QOD. And you have that in the handout that you have there. Uh, I've kind of marked it out this, and uh, made it easier to understand by putting it the, together this way. So this is what became eventually page 406 and 407 in the book QOD. And on your handout, you'll see uh, the two lines, uh, the bolded print is the print that was changed in the different sections. Line A is the pre-publication draft, and line B you'll see is the published version uh, of what you have that actually came and became QOD. So um, let's just walk through this real quickly then. Uh, the phrase, phrase original sin occurs several times, and you'll see that on your handout. Uh, you might remember this passage, Bible passage, Romans 5 verse 12. Here's what it says, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Romans 5, verse 12. Notice that sin entered the world through one man, Adam. Death came with sin, and all men began to die. Now why is it that all people begin to die? Well, it's because all have sinned in Adam. Any disagreements? What does the passage say? The passage doesn't say that all men sinned in Adam. It says, because all men sinned. So now this draft of questions on doctrine, uh, commenting on Romans 5.12, included in the main text this interesting quote from none other than Martin Luther. Martin Luther. Here's what uh, they had from Martin Luther that was going to be in questions on doctrine. This sin we bear as his children, and we are guilty on account of it, for with his nature Adam also transfers his sin to all. Did you hear that? Did you catch that? I love Luther, but this is a spot where we, we'd have to say, step back, step back, uh, Brother Luther. When QOD was finally published, the phrase original sin was changed, and you'll see it there in your draft, to Adam's sin. A little, just a minor editorial change, but we took out that, that toxic phrase, original sin. Uh, the quote from Luther was completely removed. Some pre-publication feedback had come in, and it hadn't all been positive. For example, Raymond Cottrell had written, quote, this is the first I knew that Adventists believe in original sin, at least in the technical theological definition of the word, unquote. But a question for you, did the, did the editorial changes made before publication indicate a change in the theological understandings of the authors of QOD? I don't believe it did. Because listen, think about this. If they had abandoned the idea of, of original sin, 
Why did they so desperately revise and reinterpret the Adventist teaching on Jesus' humanity? Without original sin, there, was no, there is no theological need to protect Jesus' humanity from guilt. But once the dogma of original sin is added, every effort must be made to protect Jesus from birth, nature, guilt. And be sure, in QOD, every effort is made. But the nature of Christ's humanity is only one theological domino. And this is kind of an important point I want to, I want to talk with you about here. Once this dogma has been erected around Jesus, another mutation occurs. Jesus had been seen as what? As both example and substitute? But now his example role is diminished. And the reason for that is because now you see it's alleged that his humanity really isn't like ours. It's, it's actually very different from ours. And so uh, there's a shift in understanding Christ's work in the atonement process. Jesus becomes primarily now just our substitute. Does, anybody, does this sound familiar to, to any of us? Uh, sometimes even in our current day we're hearing an idea of Jesus almost uh, mostly put in front of us as substitute and, and not commonly put together, put in front of us as examples so much. God making holy and forgiving, it's turned almost exclusively into a work of forgiveness. Why is that? Well, it's because obedience to God's law is impossible because supposedly we have a continuous human guilt because we're born with original sin. And so because of that, we, the, the other doctrine has to go away. We can't truly obey. And by the way, I would say right there, you've just um, stripped the Seventh-day Adventist Church of God's plan. You know, Revelation 14, 12. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. If this is true, we can't say that. There's a problem here. You can see the problem. All these pieces are interlinked. In the notes introduced in the Heritage Library reissue of QOD, George Knight admitted that QOD did misrepresent Adventist teachings on the nature of Christ, but he went on and claimed that on the atonement, M. Andreessen and the QOD authors were in pretty much the same place. But do you know that when you look at these texts that have to do with the atonement and the nature of Christ, did you ever notice, if you look at those together, that all these texts pretty much fit together? They're very closely intertwined. All the main New Testament texts touching the humanity of Jesus are connected exactly with the question of the atonement. These teachings, Jesus' humanity, the atonement, and the original sin, these are all interlocked. You, the QOD authors really had to, to successfully modify, they had to change all three. If they didn't get all three of them really nailed down the new way, the whole thing would be in, uh, unstable. Maybe it wouldn't stick. So is the modification of Adventist doctrine complete in the book Questions on Doctrine? And the answer is no. It is not complete. They didn't change everything. Some changes were not fully achieved. But how could it really have been otherwise? Stop and think about it. Other Adventist leaders had to sign off on this in order for the book to be advanced through the process and be published on the press. And they had to give their approval. Uh, and so if it was too radical, they wouldn't have been able to give their approval. Now it remains uh, unclear how well other Adventist leaders at the time understood the broader significance of the publication, the changes in this publication. But we know that some of the results that came after this. You know what? Even though a lot of people might have had sort of an innocence in this, th none of this makes QOD any less nefarious. Yes, I'll use the word. Nefarious. Many have had that the held that the Bible teaches original sin, but history shows that this is really a, a post-biblical development. It comes from the 2nd to the 4th century A.D., and uh, the core of this false understanding is that as fallen humans, we are born guilty. We are born such that at our essence, we are sin, or that we are sinning all the time. We are uh, said to be born basically condemned or guilty. And so if that's true, we, again, we have that problem. We're said to have been in Adam when he sinned. Before we've made a single intentional, morally informed decision, we're said to be guilty for the sin of another person. I don't know how you like that, but I don't like that idea. I'm, I haven't made a decision yet, but I'm guilty. Wait a minute. Uh, and so we have a problem there. Now listen, watch this. Once the, the doctrine of original sin is introduced, it becomes necessary to protect the humanity of Jesus from having the same nature as other men. That's why, you know what, Catholics uh, believe in this, and this is why when their baby's born, what do they do with the baby? Straight to the water for a, for a quick baptism to get, take care of that original sin problem, right? And see, when Ma Walter Martin came to the Adventist Church, he had a an understanding, pretty much, an understanding pretty much like this, quite similar to this. And he was ready to put our church in the category of a cult 
the uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church is a cult, unless we sort of showed him that we didn't believe in that, which we couldn't show him. But Froome and company somehow managed to show that to him. I say that this denies the completeness of Jesus' humanity when we take that away. Well, we've surveyed the history. Now let's take a study of Scripture, and it'll have to be a fast one. Uh, in a, if original sin is a wrong teaching, what does the Bible teach about, about sin? So open your Bible to Genesis 4 and verse 7. Cain and Abel offer their sacrifices. God accepts Abel's offering, but rejects Cain's offering. Cain becomes very angry. God pleads with Cain to do what is right, and God warns Cain, and you look at Genesis 4, verses 6 and 7, God, Cain's, God warns Cain, and here's what it says in your Bible, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. I'm using the NASB a translation. You probably have uh, equivalent things in the King James and other translations. Notice what we have here. Cain is at a crossroads. You're on the point of sinning, God says. Sin, it's, it's likened here by God to it as being like a predatory animal. It's dangerous. It's ready to pounce. The divine expectation. What is God's divine expectation even for a fallen man like Cain? You should master it. You should overcome it. The desire to kill his brother was rising in Cain, and God called on him to resist it. But we all know the answer of what happened next. What happened next, don't we? He ro rose up. He was mastered by the temptation, and Cain murdered his brother. But I want you to realize this point from the Bible. Cain and Abel were damaged children born to damaged parents. Adam and Eve had sinned. Cain had grown up just outside the garden. But notice this point. God's expectation even for fallen men and women was that they would overcome. Not on their own. In the power and strength and help of God. By the Holy Spirit's power, they could exercise self-control. Cain didn't do it. You and I need to do it. The believer is called to overcome. Zooming along, Deuteronomy 24, verse 16, texts in the Bible to give us a Bible definition of sin. Deuteronomy 24, 16, another essential text. Uh, just grab it here. Fathers shall not be put to death for their sons, nor shall sons be put to death for their fathers. Everyone shall be put to death for his own sin. Guilt and punishment, you see, come from what? From personal sin. They come for personal sin only for sin for which the person is himself responsible. Family bonds is between a son and a father do not extend to the death penalty. Sin is always personal. Let's just kind of underline that. Sin is always personal. So Deuteronomy 24, 16. And then, uh, don't stop. Let's go on to Ezekiel 18. Ezekiel 18, we find uh, another building, uh, building on the same understanding. All of this really builds off of Genesis 4, verse 7. The same understanding from Genesis as seen by the other Bible writers in Deuteronomy and now in Ezekiel. Uh, let's consider this. I'll read verses 20 to 22 from Ezekiel chapter 18. Now listen closely and let's see what does the Bible teach here about sin and condemnation and guilt, right? Ezekiel 18 starting at verse 20. The person who sins will die. The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity nor will the father bear the punishment for the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. But if the wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed, and observes all my statutes and practices justice and righteousness, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Notice, all his transgressions which he has committed will not be remembered against him, because of his righteousness which he has practiced, he will live. And we could go through, really, this whole chapter of 18, and it's, it's chock full of the same business. If you're wicked, and you repent, and you truly allow your heart to be changed, you live. The guilt is gone. If you're righteous, and you turn from what's right to what's wrong, you're guilty, and then you'll meet that in the judgment, you see? And Ezekiel 18 is just building. The prophet Ezekiel's building, because he's inspired by the same spirit that inspired Genesis chapter 4. So, anyway... Uh, Ezekiel there, in Ezekiel there's a complete separation of sin from birth nature. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Assignment of guilt is on the basis of personal choice. Let's move on and you'll go to Psalm 51 now if you'd like to turn there. By the 4th century AD, one verse extracted from Psalm 51 will be used as the main Old Testament supporting text for the original sin idea. The biblical conception of sin rooted in Genesis 4, it's, it's long forgotten now, and a certain interpretation of Psalm 51 verse 5 is presented. 
Now let's get Psalm 51, verse 5. The Bible says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Now this is interpreted to mean that David was born in sin. He and we are said to be born even in the moment, uh, born guilty, even in that moment of conception, we are in sin. Now what's interesting is, uh, you know, a lot of times conservatives, and some people would say, well, some of us here, we're all Adventist conservatives. And we're con uh, accused of proof texting all over the place. What's interesting is when you come to this text, guess what? If we look at all, at the rest of Psalm 51, we're going to find out that the people who take it this other way, really they're doing a lot of uh, proof texting with verse 5. Right? Because let's look at what else the psalm says. The inspired writer is going to be consistent with himself. What does David say in other places? Does the psalm teach original sin? No, the psalm completely contradicts the idea of original sin. So, look at verse 1, Psalm 51, verse 1 in our Bible study. Sin can be entirely removed. Do you see that in verse 1? The believer can be washed thoroughly. Verse 2, cleansed from sin. The sinner can be purified, cleansed, and washed, and rendered. In verse 7, what? Whiter than snow. David says in verse 9 that God can, can blot out all my iniquities. How many more times does it need to be said? But there it is. He can have a God-created clean heart. That's what David wants, and God can give him that. See, some say basically because of the original stain or the original guilt, really God can't ultimately give that to us. We have to wait for that. I believe we can have that right now through the power of Jesus, right now. How emphatic these statements are. Notice them in Psalm 51. Not just wash me, but wash me thoroughly. Not just make me white, but make me whiter than snow. And not just blot out my iniquities, but blot out all my iniquities. Uh, can God do that? I believe the word of God. God can do that. We say, well, we, I believe God can do it too. He's just going to do it after the after. Uh, we get our new bodies. It doesn't say it here. David was asking for it, when, and David certainly needed it there. So what about that carefully stripped of context line, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Is the psalmist talking about maybe sin in his mother? Possibility. Is the passage about David uh, reviewing his whole life, and he just sees his failures in the darkest hue? That could be what it, what's going on here. Or is David speaking more generally about being born into a fallen situation? See, we're all born outside the garden, aren't we? We're all born to parents who've exercised their free will and rebellion against God. We're part of an environment impacted by sin. Everybody here is at risk of being killed as the drunk driver crosses the, uh, crosses the dotted line in the middle of the road. Or maybe if you go to the beach, uh, you might step on a hepatitis C infected needle and ultimately die from, uh, from disease. You it, it got that way. But you, you weren't using drugs such that you would pick up hepatitis C. But we're in a fallen world, a dangerous world. I wonder if some of this might be what's going on here in our text. We suffer consequences general to our disordered world, but we only make ourselves guilty when we choose sin. Let's move to the New Testament now. And this is rather an extended section, Romans chapter 3. So we're just going to kind of again summarize. Uh, Romans 3, verses 9 to 20. So Paul is our man. And yet not even once in those verses, the people say that Paul teaches here, you know, that uh, we're all born guilty and he's teaching original sin. But not even once does Paul, Paul cite in these verses anything from Psalm 51. In fact, there's nowhere in the New Testament where Paul, who wrote about half the New Testament, there's not one line where Paul quotes from Psalm 51 on the doctrine of sin in the New Testament. But if I were Paul and Psalm 51 taught original sin, that would be the first thing on my list. I'll just go and prove it from Psalm 51. Proved and I'll just move on with my exposition. Paul doesn't do it even one time. On the contrary, Paul writes, look at uh, Romans 3, verse 9, if you would like. What does he say there? We have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. So Paul has made his argument about sin in Romans before chapter 3, verse 9. So I'd like to follow his reasoning, try to follow his reasoning through Romans 1, 17 to 2, 14. So let me just uh, summarize it to you. 
So we're looking at Romans 1, verse 17 through Romans 2, verse 14. So the non-Jews know that there's a God and that they're operating in a morally charged environment. But while they know there is a God and that their actions have moral weight, what do they do? They suppress that knowledge. They choose darkness. They place themselves in opposition to truth. Their understanding then is darkened. God gives them over to what they desire. They worship and they serve the creature. How do they worship and serve the creature? Well, how do you worship or serve anyone? It's by our actions. Paul's view of right doing and wrong doing, his view of sin and righteousness, unsurprisingly, is the same as Genesis 4, verse 7. Chosen action is Paul's focus throughout his exposition here. And all are under sin because all choose rebellion. All of us with our eyes open have chosen to engage in behavior that is opposition to God. Isn't that true? We've all chosen that at one time or another. That's how we become guilty. We don't need any help from Adam. We do it quite well on our own. Now some have had said here in Romans 3 that God is actually expanding our definition of sin. God is giving a new revelation and he's, he's showing us a new, deeper picture of what sin is. I don't believe it's so because if you look at these passages, there's about a half dozen passage here, passages here that Paul goes and quotes, almost all of them here from the book of Psalms. So, so um, for example, look at them in each, each of them and if you go back and study them and look at each in its own context, you'll see that uh, they don't come out that way. For example, in, in, uh, in uh, Psalm, and rather in Romans 3 verse 10, he begins. So the first one is Psalm 14. It talks about the fool and the wicked who fight God's people. God's people believe there's a God, and in the latter part of the psalm, Psalm 14 speaks of God's righteous people as being delivered. You know, it's not that all of God's people are wicked, but in Psalm 14, that God has some righteous people in the mix. But if you take what other people would say, you think, well, this is teaching that all people are guilty. All people are, don't, don't believe in God, but that's not what Psalm 14 says. Read it yourself. Paul quotes from Psalm 5 contrasting boastful and wicked people with those who take refuge in God. Well, are there people who take refuge in God in, psalm, in that psalm? Yes, there are. So they're not all wicked. They're not all going away from God. They're not all uh, that way. Psalm 140, he quotes from Psalm 140, asking that God would save the righteous people from evil people. Well, there's obviously some evil people there, but guess what? There's obviously some, some righteous people there. And so uh, there are righteous people. And if you studied Psalm 10, Psalm 59, and Psalm 36, the other ones that Paul quotes here, what do you find? Not one, not one of these passages teaches in their original context that all men are born sinners. So then what is the answer to this, right? All people are indeed under sin. Don't we all agree with that? I would believe we all agree with that. But not because we're born sinners, but because everyone eventually willfully participates in the same attitudes of wickedness and rebellion toward God that are described in these passages. That's how it happens. People are not born choosing sin, they're born ready to choose it. I so wish I hadn't been born ready to, so ready to choose sin. But we all have been, and we all have. So we've all become guilty. But I can't go up to Adam. When we get to heaven, I'm not going to come up behind Adam and give him a little kick and say, you know, you started this whole mess. He, he had a part in it, you know, but, but I was the one that, that became guilty, right? So the next text in our study is Romans 5, verse 12, another main passage in support of the idea of original sin. Augustine, Bishop of Hippo, popularized the interpretation. He taught that all men sinned, and this is Romans 5, 12 again, all men sinned, quote, in Adam. But the story behind that is actually very simple. Augustine was working from the Latin, in the original biblical Greek, it doesn't say all men sin in Adam. It said that because all sinned. Augustine is quoting from the Vulgate, and the Vulgate says all men sinned in Adam. Incidentally, in the current version of the Vulgate that's published, they've actually seen what a, a bad translation that was, and they've actually uh, removed that. So the current edition, because there is a current edition of the Vulgate, they're always updating everything, including the Vulgate. And if you look there, you'll see that that has gone away because it was just such an embarrassing argument that even they have removed it from the Vulgate uh, in the updated uh, scholarly edition. So, we, how is it that all men sin? It's not that we sin in Adam, it's because all of us choose sin. Now, even if somehow we inherited Adam's sin and guilt in Romans 5.12, just go up six verses, and in Romans 5.18, we would be free from sin at 5.18, because it says there that all men, 
receive justification to life from Jesus. Romans 5.12 teaches in, teaches in common with all other scripture that each person chooses sin for himself. We're not born guilty. We're not guilty for Adam's sin, but we're guilty for our own. Romans 14, verse 23. I, won't, I don't think I'll spend time on all of these uh, for the time issue here. But it says, he who, doubt, he who doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith. Whatever is not from faith is sin. That's Romans 14, 23. Uh, but each person's really responsible for the living the faith he has. He's responsible to behave in harmony with the faith he has. And we're not to be a weak in the faith of another believer. Whatever the person does that does not rise out of faithfulness or to conscience in God's will is a sinful choice. So our choices can be faithful choices or they can be sinful choices. All these choices that are unfaithful choices have guilt attached. So every morally charged decision that we make, the action taken in those decisions is one of faith or of sin. I want all my decisions to be decisions of faith. So then there's Ephesians 2 verse 3 that uh, we were by nature children of wrath, but if you look at it closely, you'll see that it's in the past tense. We were by nature children of wrath. But he says, That's such were some of you, but of course, the, as believers, we're not uh, in that situation anymore. We could talk about Ephesians 5, 6, and Colossians 3, 6. This, I, this uh, text there is called children of disobedience is the, is the phrase. But again, wrath comes upon children of what? Children of birth or children of disobedience? Uh, we become persons of disobedience by choosing disobedience. Well, we won't linger there. On to James 1, verse 13 to 15. Let no one say when, I, when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Now notice here, God has no evil in himself. He cannot be tempted by evil. He, uh, he doesn't tempt anyone by evil. How then does temptation come? Well, temptation arises when a person permits himself to center his affections on, on things that are forbidden. Then, committed to his wrongly placed desire, in effect, he tempts himself. And this is really how we all do it. We tempt ourselves. And we're very adept at it. So committed to this wrongly placed desire, you tempt yourself, you go from not sinning to sinning, and all that is what? It is a process. This isn't something we just accidentally do. You don't accidentally walk and fall into a manhole. You choose, and I choose. God forbid, we choose when we sin. It's sin, it's, this is a process that happens. To go from not sinning to sinning, it's a series of choices. First, there's lust. When wrong desire has been nurtured and becomes strong, the heart embraces it, choosing the evil. A heart embrace is really a character embrace. And when your heart embraces it, there's where you've really landed in the trouble. That is a choice to sin. Sin ripening to full maturity causes death. Wrong desire itself isn't sin. There's a process of attaching oneself to wrong desire. If you choose it, if you keep playing with it, it's like glue that, that hardens. And then one becomes trapped. Wrong thoughts, though, can be rejected. We can choose differently. Here's a little statement from Ellen White that might encourage you. And I know you'll ask. So it's Southern Watchman, February 19, 1907. Ellen White says this, and I thought this was so encouraging, if we would not commit sin. And isn't that what we want? So she's going to hit it just square on. If we would not commit sin, we must shun its very beginnings. Every emotion, every desire must be held in subjection to reason and conscience. Every unholy thought must be instantly repelled. By faith and prayer, all may meet the requirements of the gospel. None can be forced to transgress. Temptation, however strong, is never an excuse for sin. The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. She says this, Cry unto the Lord, tempted soul. Cast yourself helpless, unworthy upon Jesus, and claim his very promise. The Lord will hear. He knows how strong are the inclinations of the natural heart, and he will help in every time of temptation. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. Amen. Southern Watchman, February 19, 1907. You see what? What are we here reading here? We can live without sinning. You can resist the fallen human tendency. You can choose not to contaminate yourself. The elements are faith and prayer and self-control. 
None can be forced to transgress. Sin is, your, is one's own choice. Temptations, both external and internal, will assail, but they cannot contaminate. Contamination is chosen. And I think we're all familiar with our next text, our last text. Here is 1 John 3, verse 4. Um, you know that text? We could probably recite it. Sin is the transgression of the law. Again, focusing on choice. And I believe that 1 John 3, 4 really is echoing all the way back to Genesis chapter 4. Sin is a choice that we make. If we had time, we could talk about the seal of God and the close of probation, but let me conclude. Where do we finally land? Without QOD's change to the doctrine of sin, the modification of the positions on the nature of Christ and the atonement could never have been seriously attempted. But changes were attempted, so where does that leave the Seventh-day Adventist Church today? QOD introduced theological instability. You see that when you go into an ABC. When you go into a store and you see books offering conflicting theologies, you can understand there's some issues going on, right? Theological instability is clear. When you can find a book in the store uh, mentioning that is t giving, uh, advocating the teachings of the emerging church, and you have that book side by side with a book by Ellen White called The Great Controversy or The Desire of Ages, and those books are sitting on the same shelf or at least in the same store, there's theological instability going on. Those do not go together. And so uh, the good news I have for you, though, that's bad news, but there's good news, and it's very good news. The natural gravity of Adventism is to match the testimony of the Bible and the writings of Ellen G. White. That's the natural gravity. That's the way it's going to go. Unappreciated, though, we might find this fact, some might find this fact to be, because of this gravity, the church has settled itself on the understanding of sin held before the publication of QOD. The fundamental beliefs of the church in 2016, listen, describe the same understanding of what sin is as held by M. Allen Driesen, Allen G. White, and the early Seventh-day Adventists. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? The general conference session voted statement of fundamental beliefs made clear that the larger church had not assimilated the QOD understanding of sin. In 1980, the church did not say that we sin in Adam, but in the fundamental belief statement I mentioned at the very beginning of our talk, that what we say is this, and this is in our, today in our teachings. When our first parents disobeyed God, they denied their dependence upon him and fell from their high position under God. The image of God in them was marred and they became subject to death. Their descendants share this fallen nature and its consequences. They are born with weaknesses and tendencies to evil. Current teaching, 2016. Something that Ellen White and the earliest Adventists would have agreed with just fine. The rejection by the church, I'll say that again. The rejection by the church of questions on doctrine's single most significant attempt at theological change foretells the eventual abandonment of these other issues on the atonement and the nature of Christ. Uh, there's good news here. Uh, even Froome, at the height of his denominational power and his associates, couldn't really change the te church's teaching on this point. So uh, we've revisited these things, and uh, some still view these things through the QOD glasses. They were issued at seminary. But why would newer ministers follow this? These issues from 61 years ago aren't their issues. We can be faithful to Adventism and do what the Bible teaches. Let's pause for a word of prayer as we conclude. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for loving us and watching over us. You have not abandoned your people. You have not abandoned your church. And uh, strange as it may seem, this giant thing over QOD has still worked itself out. The, the changes were unstable. They didn't finish. And Lord, we're still here with the right teaching on this point. Help us to go forward and be faithful to Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.